Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our rainy day here for Tear Talks. Um, this is probably the biggest crowd we've had, and we, uh, we do these once a year. This is our uh, premier event. My name is Dana West. I'm on the board of directors of the Alumni Association. I'm also the chair of the Lifelong Le Learning Committee, and this is our baby. Uh, so Tear, if you haven't already read this 10 times, is talks that inspire, educate, and resonate. So we try to pick some off-kilter things and some interesting things that get people talking and thinking, and hopefully you remember last year, and hopefully you remember this one until you come back and see us next year. So um, what is the Lifelong Learning Committee? Well, we consider ourselves the fun organization as part of the uh, Alumni Association. So I see a few of my committee members here in the audience today, and thank you everyone else for, uh, for joining us. Uh, little plug since I'm up here with the live mic is that if you haven't gotten the mailing, and I think we all have, on the travel program, who doesn't want to go to Italy or Alaska and other sites to be seen in 2024? Um, we're really excited to launch that back out again. We've had a couple of problems with the pandemic here and there, so we're, uh, we're back on track, and we look forward to everybody, seeing everybody on, the, uh, on those trips. Uh, what do we have for today, though? So we have a pretty unique program, which is a solo. Usually we go with... A, uh, a group effort. Last year, if you remember, we had uh, three, but for today, we have our campus ghost stories and other folklore, a conversation with the fantastic Libby Tucker. Um, so, Libby Tucker, distinguished service uh, professor in the Department of English, General Literature and Rhetoric. She's going to be telling a couple ghost stories, and here's some good news. We got perfect Binghamton weather for ghost stories. So, enjoy it. This is the one time this is going to pay off for us, so let's, let's go with that. Um, but we don't have an end time, so if you guys want, we're going to be going as long as till we're done, whenever that is. So make sure you get some snacks before they wheel those things out. They're pretty quick at that. Get your coffee and your, your snacks. But I'm going to hand it off to Steve Siepersod, and he's going to take it from here. Thanks again. Dana, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who has uh, come out on this soggy day to be here for our homecoming tear talk. And the Saturday of homecoming weekend is... One of my favorite days of the entire year because there's so much spirit and it's so great to look out and see so many alumni, so many people who love Binghamton and want to come back and, and relive the memories that are close to their heart and make some new ones and we'll make some new memories here today. So when we launched Tear Talks, it was back in 2014 and we wanted to give alumni something really of substance as part of the homecoming weekend, knowing that this is a place with so much intellectual activity, we have so many smart people in our alumni network and among our faculty, and that's what Tear Talks was and is intended to be, a showcase for the intellectual prowess of the university, and as Dana said, uh, the formats had usually been having a couple of alumni as part of a panel around a hot topic, and uh, we decided to make a change for this year because we know that you also come back to see faculty and those connections with faculty uh, that you develop relationships with are so much a part of your Binghamton experience, so much a part of your Binghamton memories uh, that that really drives for a lot of people a decision to come back to campus for something like homecoming weekend. And so we said, let's uh, feature a beloved faculty member and let's have a great topic. And seeing the amount of faces here in the room, we feel like we really nailed it, and I'm really ready to have a, a great tear talk. And so very pleased to have Libby Tucker with us here today, and, and so thankful that you're with us. Would you like to say a few things before we dive in? We're going to do this Q&A style, and I've got some questions that are on my list. And then you see that microphone there at the center of the room. That is for you. And so if you have a question, once we get through the end of the, the interview, Feel free to come up and, and state your question or to shout it out from your seat, whatever is more comfortable for you. We do not have a hard out time, so we can stay here until it gets dark and spooky for as far as I'm concerned, and it can really have some fun with the ghost stories, but you know this program is for you, so if there's a question I don't get to that you want to ask, please don't be shy. And so with that, welcome. Thank you, Libby. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dana, for the very nice introduction. I feel deeply honored to be part of Tear Talks and to be able to share some of my favorite stories with you. And I'm thrilled to see some of my former students here in the audience and very, very happy to see you all. So thank you all so much for coming out on this rainy day. I know it, it's a, a day when it's a little soggy and hard to get around and difficult things are happening in the world. So. Thank you very much for coming. So to get us started, tell us how it was that you got here to Binghamton. 
Well, I came here in 1977. I was offered a job. I'd gotten my doctorate at Indiana University. I was very fortunate to be offered a job in the English department here. And so I was teaching my folklore classes and getting to know the campus. And then I started to hear a few stories. Would you like me to talk about sure. this next? Um, First of all, I, I heard local ghost stories, which are very important for this area. Some of my first students in 77, 78, 79 shared stories that they had collected from their grandparents who had grown up in this area. Some of them were about, for example, a silver mine on the banks of the Susquehanna River, which was supposed to contain a fabulous amount of silver. And it was guarded by native people, the legend said. And if you went out to the Susquehanna banks at just the right spot, late at night you might see a tongue of flame that was showing you where to look to find the silver mine. But even if you found it, you might not be allowed in because there might be a guard there who would only let the right people enter. I also heard stories about ghosts of soldiers from the Revolutionary War, and particularly the Civil War. And one of my friends, who still lives in this community, said that she was startled one night to see a Civil War soldier right outside the window of her bathroom. And that might not seem so strange, except that this was a second story bathroom. And so it was hovering up in the air, up really high. And so I learned pretty early that there were stories in the local community which kept alive the past all the way from the days of the early settlement of this area in the 1840s and even earlier back to Native American times. But then there were the campus ghost stories. These are my favorites. I've collected campus ghost stories all around the United States, but the best ones, I think, come from our university. I learned early in my ghost story research that school spirit is reflected in school spirits, meaning ghosts. So if you've got a lot of ghosts on your campus, then you know that this is a sign that this is a thriving community where students are happy to be pursuing their studies, happy to be enjoying each other's company and exploring new things. This is a picture of College in the Woods, where I think, Dana, you said you, you lived there when you were here. And I love this picture because the current collegiate professor, Andy Merriweather, who nicely shared this picture with me, brought his alpacas over to College in the Woods earlier this year. I think he brings them every year. And I think this picture shows pretty well the magical atmosphere that you sometimes feel on our campus, maybe especially at night when the lights are glowing and the place seems different from the area where you're taking your classes and doing all the business things. So this is a picture of College in the Woods, and this is a picture of students at Dickinson Community, where I became the collegiate professor back in 1991. Dickinson students have fantastic spirit. It's, it's one of the oldest communities on campus. In fact, it is the oldest. Here they are at the object. Some, is anybody here from Dickinson? Did you live in Dickinson? Oh, good, several Dickinsonians. But along with the spirited things that happened up on the surface at Dickinson, I learned that there were students who were interested in what happened underground, down in the sub-basements for example. There's a tunnel system under this campus, and there are signs of this kind. This was from old O'Connor Hall, taken a few years ago. And my students were interested in what might be going on down in these shadowy spaces deep underground. And there I am, a picture that Jonathan Cohen, our university photographer, took of me back in 1999. I went down to let him take a picture of me down in the sub-basement of O'Connor because students were talking about seeing ghosts in mirrors and getting the feeling that there might be some sort of ghost down in the basement. And there was a member of the custodial staff who had 
gone down to clean the light fixture of the sub-basement and then fell off the stepladder and said she felt that the spirit of a ghost named Michael had passed through her. And she was never going to clean that basement again, ever again. <laughs> and she never had to. They were very nice. They, they let her go somewhere else. So this was my introduction to campus ghost stories. What got you started into ghost stories just in general and folklore? And what was the allure to, to pursue that as an area of study? Well, um, I'd always been interested in folklore of the supernatural. When I was getting my doctorate at Indiana University, my doctoral dissertation advisor asked me to work with an exorcist for a few days. And this freaked me out a little bit. I never expected I'd be asked to work. She turned out to be a very nice woman who wanted to help troubled souls go out to heaven. And, but when I came here, I wasn't especially interested in finding exorcism. I was just interested in any stories having to do with the supernatural. And students brought them to me. I learned them from my students, learned about interesting places that my students had gone to, both in the local community and on campus. For example, there was a story about a haunted slaughterhouse that was really interesting. And the teller of the story of the haunted slaughterhouse might be right here and might be able to tell us more about it later. So I've, I've really learned so much from my students who have had adventures in many different places and told me about what has happened there. It's kind of funny because we look out the window, we've got the beautiful view and Lake Lieberman's there and then further up the hill is the nature preserve which I understand is uh, the source of <laughs> quite a number of interesting stories, and we, we talked about some and what people say they are seeing uh, lately. Uh, talk about some of those. Yes, yes. If you don't mind getting a little scared here, I'll tell you about what my students have been saying they've been seeing or feeling in the nature preserve. Many of them go out for hikes after 10 p.m., up, into, up to midnight, maybe this, this is not unusual for students. They, they just like going out and enjoying, enjoying nature. It happens more in the fall and the spring than it does in the winter, of course. But uh, I've been getting a lot of reports lately that students have sensed the presence of tall, shadowy figures out in the nature preserve. And a couple of them have said that they just felt like they were repelled backwards because there was some sort of force field with the figure. I have taken many hikes in the nature preserve myself with my husband and our dog. I've never felt anything like that, but the students have sincerely told me that they have sensed this kind of presence and they're, they're interested in it. They wonder what it is. I'm curious how these stories evolve over the years, if at all, because I think of uh, kids playing a game of telephone. It starts out with one message at the start of the chain and it works its way down and when it comes out the other side, it's something very, very different from how it started. And so as stories pass from year to year, generation to generation, do you find that like sometimes students kind of add their own little like flair to it and that, uh, that, that ghost story is, uh, is quite different at the end of the chain from compared to the start? Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Steve. Yes, that the way the stories are told and the way they vary from person to person has a lot to do with their meaning. One thing I love about studying this kind of narrative is no two stories are the same. They, each one has its own individuality. And people will add details or they'll update them. For example, there are some ghost stories about the basements of residence halls that have been taken offline because of being needed for something else or new buildings coming on. And so maybe the ghosts have to move to a different building. That happens on other campuses, too. You can't have a haunting in a building where nobody's allowed to go in, and so the ghosts move around and the details change. I was going to ask if we're doing things that um, potentially are angering the spirits. You know, it, it's something I'm sensitive to. I have an older house on the west side. I estimate it was built around like 1905 or so. And sometimes we would hear things, and so like, there have been times we've made changes to the house, and I'm like, I don't want to change it too much and destroy the history, and if there are the spirits or the ghosts that we, we upset them. It sounds like maybe some of that may be happening as changes on campus happen, and something is new, and we're here, and somebody has to move around, and maybe they don't like that. You're absolutely right. Ghosts detest change. They want all the furniture to be in the same place. Oh, sorry. Might want to hold it up a little closer. 
Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank, thank you very much for letting me know. Ghosts do not like change. In fact, there are very old stories told in New York State about ghosts moving furniture. I wrote a little article about that years ago, that ghosts will come to a house where they once lived and they will just move all that furniture around because they cannot stand to have anything different from what they were used to. This was the house as it was in their day. They don't want anything to change. So maybe I should go through some of the stories of a couple of the other residential areas on campus? Sure. Yeah, okay, because I've got, got some more slides to share with you. This is a picture of Hinman College. Did any of you live at Hinman? Oh, I'm seeing some hands, great. And with Al Voss, who was the collegiate professor for a long time in the front. Hinman is a very, very spirited community. And there, it, this is a huge number of students who all got together to celebrate their game day. And here's a picture of residents of Hughes Hall, one of the especially spirited dorms there. And there is a ghost story that students from Hughes like to tell. And that is that there was a former resident of Hughes named Charlene who loved to do laundry. Laundry was her favorite thing, especially the washing of pink clothes. And she also loved to bake brownies. And, but she didn't study because she loved so much doing these domestic activities that that was what made her really, really happy. And so she baked a lot of brownies and fed them to all of the people on her floor and she did everybody's laundry, especially enjoying doing up the pink clothes. But then she flunked out because she hadn't done any studying at all and then she died. And people say that her ghost haunts the laundry room of Hughes Hall, and that if you're up studying late at night, you may get catch the odor of deadly brownies in the air, and that this is very dangerous no matter how delicious they smell. Don't ever eat those brownies because then Charlene will want you to join her in the afterlife and not be a current student that would not be good. I have been invited by a few students at Hinman to give ghost story programs at Hughes, and every single time I've gone there and have taken people down to the laundry room, there have been freshly folded pink clothes on the dryer. Guess who folded them? Surely it couldn't have been the RA who organized the program, right? Must. <laughs> Must have been Charlene. So that's, that's a much cherished ghost story of Hinman. There's also a story of a little girl named Lily, who may be the child of settlers or maybe the child of early native people who lived there. And she's supposed to run around the stairwells and giggle and play tricks and knock on doors and run away. So Hinman is a very nicely haunted community in the best sense of the world. Now here, is a picture of me with two of our students, one of whom was an RA at Hillside. And this was a great place to be a collegiate professor, kind of wild up on the hill. Anybody here who lived in the apartment communities when you were, oh good, and I know Felicia is here, worked with me there. Um, part of the fun of being at Hillside was seeing all the wildlife the wild turkeys that were running around there and just um, seeing the higher piles of snow that piled up when it was and the bigger floods that seemed to, everything was wilder up in the apartment community. So no surprise that there were some pretty good ghost stories too. At Susquehanna, where I also was the collegiate professor, people talked about a ghostly gardener one of the gardeners was supposed to have, he had, he had actually sadly passed away there, but his spirit remained providing beautiful flowers for everybody to enjoy. My favorite ghost story though of the apartments is the story of Sam the Snacker. And this is something that, that actually happened. I haven't had too much of a supernatural nature happen to me, sadly, over the years here, but this is something that did happen. It was right after Halloween. And I arrived at Hillside Commons 
early in the morning with a big bag of Halloween candy that was left over from trick-or-treating in our neighborhood. And so I thought I would put it out on the ping pong table in the commons for all of the students who wanted candy to enjoy. So it was very early in the morning. I laid all the candy out on the table. I wanted to talk to our secretary, Pat, for a couple of minutes. Nobody else was in the building. None of the students were around. And then I came back out. All that candy was gone. It had just vanished. Nobody seemed to have come in. Nobody had gone out. It was just really quiet. And so I said to Pat, what is up with this? All this huge pile of candy that I just put out is gone. And she said, I know, it's Sam the Snacker. There was no dining hall up there. So people were always starving and grateful when we had pizza parties and things for them. And so we decided this was Sam the Snacker was the one to blame for this happening. He, he was the one who had just gobbled up all of that candy. And sincerely, I do not know where that candy went. Nobody, as far as I know, came in. Nobody went out. I don't know. It must have been Sam the Snacker. I think it, it just must have been. And then um, from more recent times, the, the last residential area where I was glad to have an opportunity to work for a little while was Newing College, right out there, uh, where I was faculty in residence in the spring of 2022. And that was when we were still dealing with some after effects of the pandemic. But students, in their very spirited way, pulled it together and had a huge Newing Navy with a big celebration. The students at Broom Hall won the games day. They were thrilled, as you can see, they were all up celebrating, very, very happy that they had won the trophy. And Newing, I would say, is a semi-haunted community. And any from Newing here? Could you? OK, good, Se several people. It's great, great place to be. Uh, Newing has the old tradition of Lake Lieberman. Here you see a picture of alumni Al Calter and Andy Wexler, who came back in the spring of 2022 to receive alumni awards because they had been fantastic editors of the Lake Lieberman Gazette. So that's, they're standing in front of beautiful Lake Lieberman there. There were supposed to be canoe rides on Lake Lieberman today. The collegiate professor John Stark had generously planned to do them, but it was just too wet. So it wasn't possible to have the canoe rides. But Lake Lieberman was named by Elliot Lieberman exactly 60 years ago this fall. So it's an important milestone to remember. And Elliot Lieberman had named the lake because it was right outside his dorm. And he told people, oh, my, my room overlooks beautiful Lake Lieberman. You should come on up and see it sometime. And one of his friends made a fake sign that looked like the other university green signs and spent, spent all of winter break putting it together. And, and the university administration very kindly accepted this and made Lake Lieberman part of the official campus landscape. Pretty soon, Lake Lieberman was on Google Earth. It was briefly changed. Briefly, its name was changed to Lake Taco Bell. Nobody knows how on earth that happened. <laughs> Nobody admitted to doing it, but shortly after people were complaining, it went back to being Lake Lieberman. And so in the spring of 2000 at the alumni reunion, I invited Elliot Lieberman to come back to Newing to celebrate what he had done for our campus in naming the lake and also in making it possible for us to have our very own monster on this campus, which is something very rare and special. Not every college has a monster, I can tell you. But this is the Lake Lieberman Swamp Monster, which back in the late 60s and 70s would help to initiate freshmen coming in. There was a tradition then that they would have a huge party on the shores of the lake. They would have races with people on rubber rafts paddling across the lake, and the monster would go and drag a freshman out of bed, bring her down. It was usually a female student, 
throw her in the lake, and then that would be the beginning of the party, and they would have a lot of beer because this was pre-1986, and <laughs> everybody would have a jolly time, and they would joke about the monster breathing fire and going after the students, and it was just a lot of fun. The monster traditions are still there. They've changed a little bit over time, um, but the collegiate professor of Newing is doing some new things to keep the monster traditions alive, which I think is, is just wonderful. And this has a lot to do with Newing being a very special community. There's also a story there about a, the ghost of a student named Brian, who supposedly haunted his room in old Newing. I don't think he's haunting the new Newing buildings, as far as I know. But he was a ghost who appeared on a computer screen with the words emple, one word E-M and then P-L-E-H. Does anybody know what that means? Thank you, yes, help me. So he was signaling to the students in his old room, who were female students, you've got to help me. You've got to help me give a message to some people. And so I, I won't tell the whole story, but it's this ghost of Brian has been part of knowing folklore for quite a while. And the monster is constantly morphing into slightly new forms. So these are good examples of the folklore that we enjoy here. When I first saw the picture of the monster that we're all looking at, I was a little frightened, I have to say. And then after that kind of faded away, I had a good laugh about it. And I'm like, yeah, let's throw it in. Let's have this as part of the tear talk. That's great. Yeah. That's one of my own students who was in my class in 2000, and she kindly offered to be the monster's victim. She didn't get thrown in the lake, though. We, we acted it out um, just on one of the corners near the Decker Health Center, and people went going by went, what? What's going on? Um, the swamp monster costume was borrowed from the theater department, which kindly shared it with us, and we had some fun. So as I hear these stories, one link that, that jumps out as being common through all of them is uh, they're being based in the, the residence halls, and I'm curious how that got to be the source of it. I'm guessing maybe because it's one of the few spaces that people are in late at night, because generally not at the lecture hall at 3 a.m., but you're going to be in your, your dorm doing laundry late at night, and then here comes all this pink laundry folded. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. That the residence halls are your home when you're in college. They're where you sleep, where you socialize with your friends, where you do some of your assignments for classes. And so, so this, is, this is where the stories originate. Also, people sometimes have dreams that are a little bit unusual and suggest something possibly supernatural going on. And typically, people aren't going to sleep for very long in class. At least, I hope not. And so the, the residence halls are the places where these stories tend to originate. I'm curious if there are any of that have originated in the libraries. Think about going up in the stacks, and you go like toward the top of the Bartle Library, and you're, you're there, and it's just you and all the books. It's pretty quiet. Nobody else is there. And you know, it seems like it could be like the run-up to something from like a horror movie. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. The library stacks are very hushed and very quiet. And of course, the movie Bo Ghostbusters develops that very well, the idea of a haunted library. I don't think we have many library ghost stories here, but there, I did hear one a few years ago when I was doing research for my book, Haunted Halls, Ghost Lore of American College Campuses, about a student who just seemed to be sleeping at the same table and just never stopped sleeping. And the reason why was that he was a ghost. And so he was just continuing to sleep and just staying with the community in that way. Very quiet, very hushed, following the rules. We got to talking before the, uh, the event officially started about how it's a very different character here at night versus the daytime. And it's kind of fun to be here at night. I'm not here at night very often. And uh, I think you may have hinted at this. So I was going to ask if you had seen anything strange or even paranormal. It sounds like you yourself haven't observed anything, but you've heard a lot of interesting things of you know, students or friends who have. Yeah. I wish I could say that I'd seen some amazing paranormal things while here. But since I'm a faculty member, I've almost never 
slept a night on campus. I did sleep in the Union one night when I came here for my interview, but I just haven't had the kinds of experiences that students have. However, I can tell you what happened to my friend and faculty colleague, Dwight, who came into the English department the same year that I did. Dwight moved into his office in the basement of Library North for a little while because his girlfriend was visiting him and they had a little fight and so he wanted to be away from home and he went to spend some nights in his office and he told me that after he had been there for a few nights, sleeping very uncomfortably on the floor, he heard a squeaking noise from the office next to him. Kind of like, rrr, rrr. It sounded like squeaky wheels of an office chair moving back and forth across the office. And he thought, wow, somebody else is here so late at night. I didn't know anybody else was sleeping in their office. So he got up and opened his door and looked out, and nobody was there, and he looked at the office next to him. It was dark. Nobody seemed to be in the office, so he just crawled back in his sleeping bag and went to bed. But the next day, he, asked, he said he asked the secretary of our department what could have been making sounds in the office next to his late at night, and she said, oh, that's the office of Professor So-and-so who passed away six months ago and he was always there late into the evening, and he was always moving his chair back and forth in his office. So when Dwight heard that report, he decided no, bad, no matter how bad things were with his girlfriend, he was getting the heck out of there. He was going to go back to his house and work things out, and he did. I've never spent a night in my office in Library North. I'm never going to do it, <laughs> ever. My office is in Old O'Connor Hall, which is one of the uh, slides you showed earlier. I've never spent a night there or wanted to or attempted to, and I don't know that I will. And I'm in on the ground floor, so I think I'm pretty darn close to what you had showed earlier. So it's going to make me not look at it the same way again, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'd be OK even if you did s sleep overnight in that building, because when they did the renovation of Old O'Connor, they got rid of the basement that looked at, like it might be haunted. It was a very old-looking basement kind of shadowy and dark. And they've replaced that with a beautiful, new, sadly unhaunted basement. So I think you'd be fine. I don't think there's It is new and beautiful looking, I'll say that. So yeah. maybe not as spooky as it, as it was back in the day. So we'll, right. we'll take it. So uh, what other elements of campus folklore could you talk about? We build this as campus ghost stories and other university folklore. So I'm kind of interested to dive into the second part of that. Oh, sure. Um, well, I'm, I've been particularly interested in the ghost story angle, but there certainly are other kinds of folklore. Uh, for example, some of the good and bad luck beliefs. We have a really active sports program at our university, as you know, and many students have told me that they want to be very careful in doing the right rituals before games to, for example, play a certain song or to put on lucky socks or to have something else that's lucky. If they're wearing something and they win their game, maybe they won't wash that shirt for a long time because they want to keep the winning with them. And there are many athletes in pro teams that do the same thing. They're very serious about their good luck and bad luck beliefs so that they, they want to make everything turn out. And the more tense things get, the closer to a, a championship, the more people think about doing that. Um, there also have been some ideas of things that you should avoid on campus. There used to be a little sunken amphitheater next to Old Dickinson. It was in a little circle. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It got taken away when they did the renovation for the new union. But students used to say back in the early 90s that if you walked across that little sunken amphitheater, you were going to flunk out of college. And I noticed nobody walked across it. Even the ones who said, that is ridiculous. That's the stupidest thing. I've ever heard. I said to one of them once, so you're going to walk across? Uh, no, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that now. So there, there are these rituals and beliefs that I think many of us have. I, have. I have some too. Even though I study folklore, I have some 
rituals that I just like to do just to, to feel good. And particularly the ideas of good luck and bad luck, I think, tend to prevail. Before computers were so common for test taking, I'd see many people with a lucky pen or a lucky pencil that they wanted to use to do well. And if that pen or pencil got them an A, then it would continue to be used. Um, these days, though, with a computer, I don't think people have lucky computers. That has morphed a little bit into a different form. I could definitely relate to the uh, what the athletes would do with wearing the same outfit or the same socks. And I used to bowl for many years, and if I had a good round, that outfit would be used the next week. I assure you, I washed it in between, mm -hmm. uh, but we would um, we would stick with it until you had a bad round. Then it was like, you know, rinse and repeat with something different and keep the, the ritual going. I won't talk about the others because I'm too superstitious to talk about any of them. But oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then there's travel rituals. You know, if you're going on a a trip, or your sports team is playing another team in a in a different area, or if you're going on a trip for a vacation. Have, have just having certain things that you do then to feel safe, like keeping keeping a certain object with you or doing things in a certain order, can just make you feel better. Anything that makes you feel better is good. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I feel good, so I make the good outcome happen. It wasn't whatever the object was. It was mm -hmm. me that did it. But exactly. you think it was something else. Yeah. So talk about what you're working on now in terms of writing and research. Oh, sure. Thank you for asking about that. Uh, I'm always working on new research. I'm primarily a legend scholar, and every year I go to the annual meeting of the International Society for, for Contemporary Legend Research and give a paper on research that I'm doing. For the last couple of years, I've been researching the stories that people have been telling during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been difficult you know, for all of us here, difficult in various ways. And um, I've found that Many students on our campus and others have told stories about ghostly things happening in bathrooms. That seems to have increased during the pandemic. Some people haven't told stories quite as much because the in-person gatherings were limited for a little while. But since everybody got back together, I've noticed there's an uptick in haunted bathroom stories and so on, and other kinds of stories. I think possibly the many sightings of the shadowy figures in the nature preserve might have some relationship to that too. When a place has gone through a difficult time, sometimes the ghost stories reflect that there's been a little more anxiety and this is one way to express it. So th those are the kinds of stories that I've been trying to collect lately. So what ghost stories do you find that uh, are noteworthy to you that are unique to, say, the southern tier of New York or maybe other college campuses that you've had a chance to visit? Well, there, that's, a, that's a good question, and I could probably keep talking about that until midnight if you want to stay that long. That might be a little too long, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it depends on where you are, which, which campus you're on. I, I really like the stories of this campus the best because this is where I've been for a long time, and I've loved, loved seeing this campus grow and loved, loved hearing the stories that people tell that reflect the experiences that students have had. Um, campus at Cornell, for example, there are a lot of stories that ref reflect the topography there, the, the beautiful gorges, and ghosts that might appear around the gorge warning people not to jump, to stay safe. A lot, a lot depends on what the campus is like. If you have a lake, like Lake Lieberman, or if you have hills, if you have some other features, then those are going to influence the kinds of stories that people enjoy telling. That is a great question, yes. Uh, yes, oh yes, good. Um, And I'd be glad to repeat questions before answering them so everybody can hear them with the assist of the microphone. Thank you very much for asking that. Uh, sometimes they do develop from things that actually happen. But I've learned that more typically, the stories are very meaningful. And they have some kind of kernel of truth 
but they're not based on something historical that actually happened. For example, that slide I showed you of the Dickinson sub-basement with the danger sign and with me next to that step ladder, there was absolutely no record of anybody having a problem or becoming a ghost down in that basement, but the story was still very meaningful for students. So I have this one ghost story that my grandma told me, and it says that and they're doing the second floor of the Glen G. Barter Library. The doors always open by themselves. I think I'll call I'll call the ghost Sam. The I meant not Sam, but but who? What is the name? Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, David the David the Elevator Man. Oh, what a great story! Thank you so much for telling that. David. You're welcome. <laughs> that, Sorry for putting my face on the mic. Oh, that is wonderful. Thanks so much for telling us about David the Elevator Man. That's a new story. I'd never heard that one before. I have heard other stories on this campus and others about elevator doors opening and closing strangely. Um, that, that is great. I really appreciate your sharing that story with us. Just briefly mention that at Gettysburg College, which was there when the Civil War happened. They have a hall, Pennsylvania Hall, where the elevator doors are supposed to open sometimes and let you see the inside of a working Civil War hospital. Just sort of randomly, every now and then, you'll open the doors and then you'll see doctors and nurses running around taking care of soldiers who need medical help. Uh, you mentioned that ghosts don't like things moved around. They want things where they were. I was wondering, for those of us interested in cultivating our relationships with ghosts, if you can tell us some other tips for keeping things going, keeping things okay. And um, if you could talk a little bit about your own personal relationship with ghosts. Oh, sure, be glad to. Um, I have learned by talking with students over the years about the care and feeding of campus ghosts. Uh, one thing I've learned from them, especially our RAs, who are fantastic, highly resourceful people, that if you don't like a ghost bothering you, you should just say in a very loud ghost voice, go away, ghost. I've heard multiple stories told by RAs about their being all alone on their floor doing door tags and hearing furniture moving around in nearby rooms. And the more assertive of those RAs just say, look, Get out of here, ghost. Every single time, the ghost goes away. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you feel like you're being bothered, if there might be something supernatural there, just speak up. They're, they're kind, they will usually back off. But as for my personal relationship with ghosts, um, I don't know that I really have <laughs> much of that because I'm more of a scholar who studies the stories, but I appreciate ghosts very much. I think they're important, they're meaningful. I am always delighted to learn a new ghost story such as the one about David the Elevator Man. We'd love to have more questions. For We're gonna look for David, I think, next time we go to the library. So at yes. least I know I will. Mm -hmm. Hi, I, I, <clears throat> I'm a local here and I love urban exploration, whether it's the State Hospital or Spring Forest Cemetery or all the stories around the Southern Tier in general. Uh, and I got the privilege to do a visual profile of like the heating plant here uh, on campus, which until you've been in it, it's like I didn't know that something like this existed, which is a really crazy building on the interior if nobody's got a chance to see it. So my question to you would be, what would be a cool place around campus that you think is under-recognized or under-appreciated that people who like to explore might, might spend more time looking around or finding? Uh -huh. Great, great question, thank you. And I'm glad to know that you've, you've had some time to do explorations yourself. Um, I, I think that the basements on campus can be very interesting, especially, especially when it's not too busy, not too many people are running around. Um, some students have told me that, that they, they've seen really interesting sites down in the basement and, it's, and sometimes they've gotten lost. It's like a maze. And of course, we, we have some, some corridors down in the basement which, which are open to everybody. And we have other tunnels which are closed off. They're only for maintenance use. And I wouldn't 
p encourage people to try to get into them, but they're, they're interesting places. Some of my students have said they'd, they'd like to go in, but I mean, like, they, they, get, they get to hear the stories. The Nature Preserve is a fantastic place, probably the best place to explore on campus. There are all sorts of animals there and all sorts of interesting things that happen. There's something about basements. I don't like going to my basement, but that's not really a new thing. I've always been like that ever since I was a kid, but mm -hmm. you know, I've always found it kind of spooky. But I'm, I'm glad the gentleman here asked about w what to do to cultivate the relationship with ghosts. There probably is a rough paraphrasing of it, because when you said the ghosts don't like change, I was thinking, what do they like? You know, and so like, I think if I hear something at home, maybe I should do something, though it could be a mouse, and maybe there's nothing I could do. Yeah, that, that's a great point. If, if you have something that seems like it might be a ghost, then people say usually the best thing to do is just speak kindly to the ghost and say, I know you're here, or I know you might be bothered that some of the furniture is moved, but it's okay, uh, we respect you, and we appreciate your being here. Come on up. There was another um, story, because I used to work nights here, and uh, a friend of mine worked over in ICD, and they used to see uh, like an per, uh, adult and a child sitting out and outside on the bench and see it in the cameras. Mm -hmm. And then they'd go out and there'd be nothing there. So, I mean, that was, that was fairly recent. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you for telling us about that. And actually, we think the guy in the um, library was Frank because he had worked here and he died here. So we figured oh. it was Frank opening the doors for us every time we came up to him. Okay. But Thank anyway. you for sharing that. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. Michelle. Hi there, Libby. Hi. Can, can you tell us what makes a good, go a good ghost story and how does something evolve from I heard a sound and it turned out to be a mouse to becoming a ghost story, and what's the difference between a the the lane that is a ghost story or folklore and legend? How what's what's this real estate look like from an academic perspective, as uh -huh. well as what makes a good one? Yeah, th those are two great questions. Thank you for asking. Um, I'd say many many stories have the potential to become ghost stories that are widely told from one person to another, but it's it's all in how you share them with others. I could just give an example from my own experience when my husband and I and our son moved into our house in Vestal, we noticed that our upstairs, one of our upstairs bathrooms had 1940s music playing in it at odd moments. Even though there was no radio, no source of sound that we knew about, and dance, ballerina dance, songs like that. And um, we didn't know how to explain it. We just knew that the music came and went. We wondered if maybe there was some sort of metal in the light fixture that caused the 1940s music to come in, or could there be some sort of ghost that liked music? Um, and after a while, it looked a little rusty, so we got rid of it. The music has never come back, and so I guess maybe it was the light fixture. But I would say that this is an example of something domestic that happened in our house that became a story because I started telling it to my classes. This is an example of something that could happen to anybody. It doesn't seem to have a rational explanation, but is interesting and can be connected to the supernatural if you want to do that. Now, I could have taken that one step farther and I could have said that I thought it was the spirit of somebody who had died in the 1940s, although the house wasn't built into the 1960s, so that might not have worked too well. But there's always the potential for something that happens in your real life to become a great ghost story. It's all how you share it and also how how others might receive it and maybe pass it on and add details. It's all, it's all in the telling. Thanks for asking. How does it feel to have been here for so long and have so many students and know that these stories resonate so strongly with them? And so, you know, somebody is a certain amount of years out from being here, they're not gonna remember anything from Calc 1, but they'll remember this creepy looking thing on the screen here. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. It makes me really happy to know that people are interested in the stories. And I, I, I love seeing the way the stories constantly grow and change. 
depending on, on so many things, the students who, who come in with different interests and, and plans for their lives after college. And, and so it, it's a very dynamic process. Um, the Lake Lieberman monster, I think, is a nice example of that because the, this monster has been meaningful to students for almost 60 years and probably will be for a lot longer, but the circumstances keep changing, and so, so it just depends on how the story's told and what the students are interested in later on. Dana? I've got two questions. Easy one first, I think, and I yeah. hope. Can I ask you to show off that coat and tell us the story behind it? Oh, the one you're sure. wearing. Uh -huh. And number two, um, I'll let you do that first, and then oh, I'll ask you a second question. Sure. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's very nice of you to ask. This coat um, comes from India. It was given to me by my friend Suzette, and it has one figure here that looks like a ghost with long white hair, and another one that looks like a maiden in a tower. And you can see all, there are all sorts of stories that are reflected in the figures on this Indian coat. And I wear it. Sometimes when I'm going to class or when I'm giving a special talk like this, because this is, this is my coat of stories, and I like to wear it for special occasions. Thank you. Uh, second question. With the last few years of everything being technology and instant access and quick dispersal of information, what do you see as kind of the future of storytelling and folklore between people getting together in small groups and it eventually kind of trickling out into the world versus maybe people not getting together as much as they used to and the speed of things and the size of things. How do, how do you see things going from here? That's, that's a great question, which certainly we should ask as communication changes with lightning speed from one form to another. Communication has changed so much since I came to this campus. And, and I've wondered sometimes whether the storytelling might stop because people tend to be on their computers a lot. And this is one way that people share the stories they've heard. Also, I've noticed through talks with my friends at our Legend Society that a lot of the storytelling is becoming very visually oriented, taking the form of memes rather than complete legends that are shared from one person to another. I think it's pretty clear that we continue to be interested in stories, we continue to care about communicating with each other, but yes, the medium of communication does make a difference. And when you're sharing online with a big group of people with very quick transmission, then, then that makes a difference in the way the process works. Thanks. So dating myself, it was a cartoon. Casper, the friendly ghost. Casper, the friendly ghost, the friendliest ghost in town. Which would suggest, if there was a cartoon about this friendly ghost, that it would at least suggest to me that was um, an anomaly, that most ghosts would not be friendly, and yet you seem to be suggesting that ghosts are really nice and friendly. So I'm wondering if you might help to clear up this controversy. <laughs> and then second, um, just talk a little bit about multiculturalism and how that relates to um, ghost stories or storytelling in general. Definitely, Th those are great questions. Th thank you very much. Um, not all ghosts are portrayed as friendly. Um, in fact, the first ghost story that I heard on this campus was about a possible hostile spirit in College in the Woods, which never was proven to be anything hostile, but students, it was around the time the movie The Exorcist was being shown frequently, and I think people were thinking more about maybe something hostile being in the halls. Uh, but it's been my experience in collecting ghost stories that a great majority of the stories are about spirits that come for good reasons. They want to cheer somebody up, they want to particularly be close to people they've cared about. Charlene in Hughes Hall wants to be with students at, in the place where she was a student herself. Um, sometimes the word visitor is used for these friendly ghosts, that they, they simply want to come and visit. They don't want to bother people. They don't want to make any waves. They, they just want to be there, and they want to keep continuing whatever they were doing when they were alive. I'm sorry, the second question hopped out of my head. Uh, the second one has to do with multiculturalism, because I'm, yes. when I think about ghosts, I think that ghosts are white. So is this about 
white people? Thank you. Uh, ghosts very much come from different cultural areas. And for example, among native people, there are many ghost stories that are extremely important. Um, stories of skeletons, for example, chasing people, um, spirits of the ancestors coming back for a reason. And in Asia, there are a great many ghost stories that people tell. Asian ghost story traditions are absolutely fascinating. They're reflected in some of horror movies such as Juan, The Grudge, Japanese. And so it is, I'm really glad you asked about that. It's very important to be aware of the multiculturality of ghost stories. Uh, European ghost stories tend to have gotten their hold on the American land because they were some of the prominent stories that were told when this country was first coming together. But there are ghost stories from all over the world and the cultural background of each story is very important. I want to, f this question's a little bit of a follow up on the question Dana just asked about the impact of technology on ghost storytelling. Mm -hmm. So while he was asking that question, it caused me to say, okay, let me see what ChatGPT has to say about a ghost story. Oh boy. So I asked ChatBT to write a very short ghost story about Binghamton. And I won't read it, but I will say that it spit out this seven paragraph tale about a ghostly widow named Eleanor on Water Street. Are you aware of anything in the lore about something here in Binghamton on Water Street as it relates to a ghost story? Oh, what a what a terrific thing to do! That that that's very creative. Thank you. And I'm afraid I have not heard of this Eleanor. I certainly know about Water Street. I've been to Water Street, but yeah. And I I have asked, I have also asked Chat GPT to write things for me. It writes very funny poems, sea shanties, for example, that you can give to friends as birthday gifts if you want to. And I asked Chat GPT to write papers following the assignments I was giving my students because I was curious, some of which had to do with ghosts because I'm teaching two Folklore of the Supernatural classes this fall. And um, ChatGPT tends to do what the AI experts call hallucinate at times. It, if it doesn't know what it should say, it makes something up. And so I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that that might be something that Jat GPT made up based on its knowledge base. But it's certainly possible that there's a story about a widow named Eleanor that I just haven't heard yet. So thank you, that's great. I think we have a new character now, Eleanor on Water Street, established yes. 2023. Yeah, students yeah, good. write a story to background it. So I could, could do that, sure. I have uh, two questions. Um, how are you? Um, one is uh, the Pine Barrens have the Jersey Devil, mm -hmm. right? So is there a infamous character in the southern tier Binghamton area that people talk about? Because I had a friend when I was going to school here who was living, we, living in town, and she told me about a character that terrified me. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this character, but it's called Pigman. Yeah, I've heard of Pigman. Okay, Man. so I don't know if you want to speak about it. Why, I, why don't you speak about it? I can't it. even Tell speak me what about you know. it in the daytime. <laughs> yeah. So that's one. And then the other thing is, I know Halloween is the obvious time of year for everyone to have their supernatural encounters, but have you noticed on campus that the students are coming to you more around exam times, or is it the end of the year? Is there being sad to leave, or is there any time frame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, it's particularly before Halloween in late September and October that people tend to be aware of the ghost stories because with the weather changing and with the dark coming down and the leaves turning colors, we're all more aware of supernatural traditions at this time. But yes, it's, a, it's also the academic year, midterms and finals. Those are times when there's more stress. Everybody's under more pressure. I certainly remember feeling that when I was a student at Mount Holyoke myself. And so, so these stories are more likely to come up at those times, but they can also come up during the summer sometimes. It's, and, and sometimes you hear about things that have happened that are verified, for example, by the local police. 
I've, I've talked with some of our UPD members who have talked about seeing strange lights and in the summer often when these stories aren't supposed to be quite so common, but they'll talk about going on patrol, seeing lights moving across, say, the top of one of the buildings at Old Dickinson. And um, so the stress points in the change of seasons are particularly good times for ghost stories, but you can have them pop up other times too. It kind of made me think of a question I was going to ask in terms of like the strange lights. I was gonna ask if there was ever a thing here where UFO sightings were common or fairly common. I tend to remember that from like the early 80s as a little kid and watching things on TV and it was like for a while, you know, that was very much a thing in pop culture was the UFO sightings. Right. Yeah, and um, I have not heard a single UFO story told on this campus or even in this local area. When I was growing up in Colorado, I heard them all the time because people would go out to the Mesa and that was just a big elevated area and they would talk about seeing saucers or seeing, seeing something strange happen. But I don't know, have any of you heard UFO stories around here? I'm afraid I'm just clueless in that way. Interested in them, but people around here don't seem to be telling them, at least not to me. I think we need to start when Eleanor was walking down Water Street. <laughs> and saw you Maybe she came from a flying saucer. You never know. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Um, going back to the in topic of the internet, um, because I know the internet's developed a lot very rapidly in the last like 20 years, uh -huh. um, and obviously with communication and how fast word spreads, but it's also become a world of its own that creates its own folklore and legends. Like I think back about um, when I was a kid and I'd get emails being like, if you don't pass this on to 10 people, you're gonna die tonight, and it would freak yes. me out. I'd have to send them to my mom because I was just so scared. Uh -huh. um, and then there's also later on about like Slender Man, which is this like oh, really yes. like lanky, long creature, um, creature who can like, who kills children, I think, or something like that. And that became, started off on, the internet and then became more of like a, a thing in real life. So I was just wondering what you think of like maybe the internet as a place where, where legends are based in the future, how that might progress mm -hmm. and change. Thank you so much for asking about that. And what happened with Slender Man was extremely significant for all of us who study legends and for everybody else as well with it starting in 2009 in a chat forum and then ending up being the stimulus for a, a terrible accident that happened in Waukesha, Wisconsin with some 12-year-old girls whose lives were deeply impacted by what took place. That showed in a very dramatic way that things that happen on the internet are not just playful and not just easy to deal with. For many people they are, but there's always the possibility of people taking something so seriously that it gets out of hand. And so this is certainly something to be careful with. It was a shock to my fellow legend scholars and me when we heard that the stabbing in Wisconsin had happened. We never, ever would have expected that. And we were saddened that our favorite kind of story had become the reason why this, this terrible thing happened with the young girls. We need, to, we need to be careful with kids. We need to help them stay safe and to educate them about the internet being a fascinating learning tool, but also having its dangers. You have to be very careful. Good question, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Do people still step or stomp on the coat? Oh, great, yes. Do people still step on the coat? Uh, that has not happened, Steve. P are people still stepping on the coat at all? I haven't heard of it. They are, but not as much of, as they used to, and not an every year thing. So maybe the last one was a year or two ago. It, I feel like it's been a while since I heard about it, so it's not as much at the forefront of the pop culture as it was. Yeah, it, it used to be such a huge thing that OCC, Off Campus College, did it, and they would have this wonderful celebration with tub after tub of Pat Mitchell's ice cream, and there was a certain student who had just come and whomp on this old parka, and everybody would cheer and eat lots of ice cream and just have the best time, and it's, it's nice to know that they're still keeping it alive to some extent, but 
it's kind of a different world now. Some of the some of those older rituals, such as OCC had, and some other groups had, it seems to be a little different. There are many wonderful things that happen on campus, but I think the pattern has changed some. Casey. So you're still teaching those same courses where you had asked me over a decade ago, or in my classmates, to go out into the community if we were able and experience something supernatural, or at least go to a supernatural place off campus. Um, and I know you referenced that I, my group and I went to a slaughterhouse, um, but I'm wondering where kids are going now. Oh, great, yes, thank you. And your, your exploration of the haunted slaughterhouse was one of the best projects that I had during my years. Um, and that haunted slaughterhouse, I believe, is now a doggy daycare. At least we take our dog there. Oh, very good, very good. So that, that is such a terrific example of a haunted place morphing into a place that is greatly helpful to people in, in their adult lives. Uh, so where, where are students going now? I'm teaching two courses with students who are forming teams and going out into the community. They're going to the haunted mansions. They're going to Robertson and Bundy and Phelps. One team is going to the Nature Preserve. They want to see what's up with those shadow men. And um, one team is thinking about maybe going to the local church, Christ Church, which is a beautiful church with important supernatural traditions that mean a lot to the congregations. So mainly, mainly the local places, but not so much the off the beaten track things such as your wonderful haunted slaughterhouse. Yeah, we definitely were breaking and entering maybe a little bit, but um, it was terrifying at there. So it's it's all pause in now on Airport Road. Um, and we were there in, before it became a daycare, like right in that in-between spot. And we truly did find a barrel of cow legs that still had meat on them. Like it was just done being a slaughterhouse. Really, really terrifying. Um, so I couldn't tell you if I had any actual ghost experiences or if I was just scared by every noise that happened. But I still have uh -huh. the like the film of us just running away, and it was awesome. <laughs> it, it was, and I, I'll, I'll never forget that film. Uh, I think finding a bucket of cow legs would be horrifying enough. You don't need any ghosts <laughs> on top of that. And I remember your group talked about just uh, having a sense of the animals who had been alive and then were not after being there. Yeah. Please, yeah, if you could talk to the microphone, that would be great. So you were uh, talking earlier about like generational, like how things get passed from generation to the next. So um, I just, I, I've always thought about how in colleges, like a generation is so much shorter. It's only like four years instead of like someone's whole lifetime. So like, have you noticed that like, it and as like the campus stories as opposed to like the like off campus ones have you noticed that like the campus ones like evolve and change differently or like more quickly or anything oh that that's that's a really interesting question thank you yes um the generation on campus is is f about 4 years some people stay a little bit longer and so that does make things evolve quickly and ev but every year fresh troops are pouring in. Every year, new students arrive. And the, the students coming in as, as first years may have somewhat different interests than the students before. And so the kinds of stories that they tell or the stories that they find interesting may, may evolve over time. For example, we have so many students now who are studying neuroscience. Uh, that was not the case when I first came to Binghamton. And so we have many people who are just very interested in what's going on with the human brain and how we can understand that and how different kinds of stories reflect those processes. I had, uh, yeah, because at my, at my previous college, I was there in that area for eight years and other people had only been there four years and there was like this this haunted place that everyone said was haunted because there was like broken dolls found all over the floor and it was like this big thing but it I had actually been there when the original the original thing had happened that was the reason all that stuff was there so like I for me it wasn't a legend but for the rest of the 
school it was because uh -huh. I had been there so much longer. <laughs> oh, great, great example. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, it's all in your own perspective. And the longer you are in a place, I think the, the more richly you participate in the traditions that you find there. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention that actually, we actually just got our first uh, neuroscientist, uh, dedicated neuroscientist here at Binghamton with, um, oh, I forgot her name off the top of my head, in the BME department, but besides the point. Um, I was just curious in terms of, as you mentioned before, in terms of with the internet and also with, you know, the sort of urban exploration, where you see, you know, different places that have largely been forgotten by history be brought back on the internet. I was just curious, do you feel in terms of with, you know, with legends, folklore, ghost stories, do you feel that the internet has been more of a net positive or do you feel it has been more of a net negative for, um, for this uh, field? Mm, that, that's, that's a very thought provoking question. Thank you. I, I would say that, on the whole, the internet has been more positive. It, it is, it's enriched our sense of information capability and also of history. For example, if you heard that there were stories told about the Binghamton Psychiatric Center, which was originally known as the Binghamton Inebriate Asylum, and there's, there's still an old building there, you can go online and easily find beautiful pictures of the in interior and exterior of that building, you can learn about the history, learn about the, some of the contestation of things that happened there. So you can just learn so much, so much more quickly with the internet than it would have been to have to go to an encyclopedia or ask around. That's absolutely, and I actually, well, the closest I've been to anything that would be, um, um, I was, when I was at, uh, in the Boy Scouts, I actually went to, um, we were in uh, Philadelphia, we actually went to Eastern State Penitentiary, which has this whole big oh, haunted yeah. house every year, and of course, with, with, with tales of different uh, um, stories with various uh, prisoners who were there up until it was uh, closed in the, I believe, in the 1960s or 70s. Uh -huh. A good example. Some of my students have been interested in the Eastern State Pen Penitentiary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, interestingly enough, my question refers to the Binghamton, Binghamton Psychiatric Center. Um, I'm an alumni of the nursing program here, mm -hmm. and um, as part of our curriculum, we had to go to the Binghamton Psychiatric Center and do a, a clinical there. And um, I'll never forget going there and how creepy that building is. Especially mm -hmm. it was winter and it had just snowed and it was very, very creepy. And they took us to like a basement part where there's like a little mini museum and they had like old like accoutrements from back in the day when they used straight jackets and they had like tables with leather straps and all kinds of creepy stuff down there. So I was wondering if you had heard any like good ghost stories about this Binghamton Psychiatric Center, if it's like haunted by past patients or something like that. Because I remember thinking, oh, this place has got to be haunted. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, so. yes. Thank you for telling us about that. I, I, I think that when you talk to people about p potentially haunted places in this area, the Binghamton Psychiatric Center tends to rise to the top. When I wrote my book, Haunted Southern Tier, I showed the publishers several pictures of buildings around here and they all agreed it had to be the picture of the Binghamton Psychiatric Center because it looked, they thought, much spookier than anything else. And that book does contain a story about um, several people reporting that they had gone at night to the Psychiatric Center, which by the way is not allowed so I wouldn't encourage anybody to do it, but people have done it. And they had seen what looked like a patient wearing a white nightgown up at the top of a staircase, sliding down that staircase, and then going back up to the top and sliding down again. So there is, there's much meaning in that because many people lived in the inebriate asylum, known by other names later, and spent many years there. Some of them you know, never, never survived to leave. And, and it's some sad histories there. And so the ghost stories, keep that past history alive. They help to educate us about what happened there. Any other questions from the audience? These have been great questions. I've appreciated all your questions so much. You've taught me a lot in asking questions and sharing your stories. With that, let's give a nice, oh, one more. Yes, go ahead.
approach. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's spirits, right? So it's, so it's like a difference of spirits and ghosts. So I, I, I think it's like the multicultural relationship to ghosts depends on where you're at, right? So in my culture, the, there is a fear of ghosts, mm -hmm. but then there's a kinship with spirits, mm -hmm. right? So there's a difference. And so then there's not so much fear versus maybe there's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And then the more you understand, the closer that relationship gets and it's a spiritual one. So I just want to make that comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> yes, that, that's su that is such an important point. May I ask um, what what culture is you? So my, so my parents are from the Caribbean. So yeah, they, I mean, it's, it's such a close relationship with spirituality that there is legend and lore of ghosts, but it becomes almost a close relationship within the generations of, and, and the stories change, and either they get farther with fear or closer with like. Mm -hmm. uh, you put that so beautifully. Thank you. Farther with fear and closer with kinship. I, I love that. And in Native American cultures as well, there are many different Native American groups, but you see the, the same thing that the ghosts, the ghosts are sacred. They're, they're part of your family. And um, some Native American authors has, have commented for, that for non-Native people, the ghosts may seem scary and intimidating and difficult, but for the people themselves, this is part of their family, part of their history, part of their tradition. It matters to them, but it, it's nothing extraneous that should be frightening. It's, it's part of who they are. So thank you very much. Thank you, that was a great comment. I'm glad you were able to get that in, and it's, uh, I think, a very nice place to, to help us to, to wrap it up. So I'd like to have a nice round of applause for Libby Tucker. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Libby, thank you so much for, for being part of this event, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you to all of you who came out on this soggy day, and I'll toss it to Dana West for a few closing comments. We'll wrap it up for this uh, 2023 Homecoming Tear Talk. Thank you okay. so much, Fumble. <laughs> Missing an important part there. Anyway, uh, again, big round of applause for uh, Libby and Steve. Thank you so much. You know, I hope to see everybody back here in roughly about a year, right? And, and the worst part about having these things is that it takes us, we only have another year to come up with something that's as good or better. So the challenge goes on and on, and we hope to, uh, to meet that, that challenge. So uh, next up, we have 3 o'clock is the Fall Festival. I'm assured that there is some sort of tent covering to keep your heads dry. Uh, music, food. So uh, I ask everybody to go down to the, uh, the West Gym. Uh, they, uh, they'll be prepping for the soccer game, which I think is still on? Soccer is still on 6 o'clock. Okay, that might be a little soggy, but uh, fall festival, not soggy, and I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>